All right. This is the philosophical angle. Defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available free online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick uh, graduated from Yale, has an MA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, and is retired from the investment banking industry. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts and topics being used in current media and offer an explication of its essence. This week, the subject is the current statement by Obama and uh, some in his administration about an obligation to spread wealth around. I think it was said the other day that people who start their own businesses don't do it by themselves. That there are others involved in their success. Well, let's, uh, let's examine this. Let's explore this statement and see whether that's true or not, whether there is an obligation to spread the wealth around, whether somebody does it by themselves to become successful, does he do it by himself or not? Let's go to, uh, let's go to our first board here. Obligation to spread it around. Well, first we have a, everything that we do is a sacrifice. And uh, we sacrifice our risk and our knowledge and our time and our effort and sometimes our material to get a reward. And if, you're, uh, and if you've started a company, you're an employer. An employer does exactly the same thing. A company does exactly the same thing as an individual does. A, a company sacrifices its risk. In an in a atmosphere of risk, it sacrifices its knowledge, its time, its effort, its material to get a reward, otherwise known as a profit. And from that profit, it hires people and creates jobs. And this is good, obviously. You want jobs. And it all comes from profit. So the jobs create uh, people who have jobs. They, they use that as, a, as their as to, to get a reward from their employer, which is normally in the, in the uh, fashion of money, unless it's a barter situation. But in modern times, it's pretty much all done by money. So you off you go to the store. You show up at, uh, at Walmart, CVS, any number of stores, and you make an exchange. You exchange your sacrifice for a product that came from a manufacturer who did the same thing. So from your job, you made a sacrifice at your job to get a reward, to go to the store and get that which is going to make your life good. Manufacturer does the same thing. He sacrifices his, his, his knowledge, his time, his energy in an in a, in a environment of risk and he sacrifices his material and he makes a reward and that reward he takes as a product such as a like, so like fire machines or whatever or, or toothpaste or whatever and and he sells it to the store and the store pr provides an area of exchange where the rewards and the sacrifices are exchanged okay that's that's kind of an introductory to uh, to business so let's go to uh, let's go to number two here. In our pre-wealth situation, of course, the, in, in, in number one, this is how wealth is created from the profits that is otherwise known as reward for which you've sacrificed for. 
So in the pre-wealth situation, let's say before an entrepreneur becomes wealthy or starts his own company, he probably had to go to school for it. So let's use that as one of the things that possibly could be predicating, preceding the, the situation where there's an obligation to spread it around. So let's say he's a, a student at one time and he sacrifices his his time and his effort and his et, uh, to, to learn all about what he's interested in at school in the course of, let's say, it's engineering or it's law or, or, or general education or wherever it is. And from that school, he has he's gained learning. And that's the product of the school. That's the exchange. Because on the other side of the student is the teacher. The teacher sacrifices their time, their energy, and their knowledge at the school to produce an environment for learning. <coughs> so the teacher and the student exchange in an educational environment. So the student becomes learned through his sacrifice, and the student provides the learning through the teacher's sacrifice in whatever discipline that the student is interested in. So now we come to a, the third phase of the obligation to spread it around. So as we've explained, we've got the reward which produces money from a job. And here, maybe at a store, you've got an exchange. But at the exchange, there's a contract made. Whether it's nominal, whether you're at the store and the, and, and, uh, the cash register rings up a, an amount, and you put across your, your sacrifice that produced your reward in the form of money. So you've put that across, and you get your, your product at the store, whatever it is. Brand new TV set or something. In that contract, in every contract and in every agreement, There is an obligation and a right. So you have an obligation to give money to, uh, to the store. Let's say it's Walmart. And they have an obligation to give you the product for which you're looking to get, which you've gone there to get. You have a right to receive. So on the other side of that obligation, you have a right to receive the product. Walmart, on the other side of your obligation to give the money, they have a right to receive the money. So uh, how is all this significant? Well, it's significant that up until our obligation to spread it around, all the previous here contracts in every situation have been canceled out because the obligations and the rights have been satisfied. So when we go back to Obama's original statement, obligation is spread it around. There, where is that obligation? The other obligation can only exist in a contract. There are no contracts open for our, for our entrepreneur who started a new company and become successful or has gone to work for somebody else and has a, uh, a, a very uh, successful company and is earning a good deal of money by doing it from his learning, which he paid the school for. That contract is, uh, is, is, uh, has been successfully completed. So I would like to state that when a government official says that somebody didn't do it themselves. 
and have an obligation to take their earnings and their reward for whatever they did. And they have an obligation to spread it around because they didn't do it themselves. From what we see here, there are no open obligations to do so. And that everybody here did it themselves. I'd like to ask my panelists, Rick, what are your thoughts on this recent iteration by the Obama administration? Well, it's, it's obviously generated a lot of laughs on the conservative blogs and conservative talk shows. And while it's probably a gaffe. It does certainly reveal a mindset which is completely alien to your average entrepreneur. One of my th one of the things I do as a profession is I'm an angel investor, and that means I meet a lot of entrepreneurs. I invest in their companies. I do due diligence reports about these companies. I'll probably be starting another one next week. And I look at new technologies. And so I get inside the process by which a company, at a very early stage, goes to the next stage where they typically have just developed a product for the first time. And then they want to bring it national or international and, and develop a sales network and grow their client base and, and hire uh, qualified people and so forth. Um, what I have observed amongst virtually all the entrepreneurs I've talked to is dealing with the government is the last thing on their minds. Uh, they are worried about uh, enhancing their product. They are worried about uh, making sure their patents are in place. They are worried about ensuring they have qualified people doing the right jobs. They are worried about payroll, making payroll. That's a constant refrain. They are worried, incidentally, about raising money, because it's scarce, to expand their businesses. They do not think in terms of, well, what could the government do for me today to help me grow my business? You know, are they going to assist me with hiring someone? Are they going to provide the capital? Are they going to give me a patent? I mean, none of these things enter into the mindset of a typical entrepreneur trying to build a business from essentially scratch. So. The fact that Mr. Obama seems to think that businesses uh, look somehow to the government as an inspiration or as a partner or as a source of any kind of the any of the factors required to make a business successful is kind of shocking. I agree. The uh, businessman really is just interested in his daily effort, in his in his right, in his right equation. He's sitting there and trying to produce his product and nothing else, and he's not thinking or seeking help from the government or or anything else in society. He's just interested in that one thing. And so it seems kind of a, a ridiculous uh, statement to suddenly come across and say, gosh, uh, businesses don't do it themselves. And when, they, when they're completed and they make a profit, they're obliged to spread it around. Well, they already do spread it around. Is not that the tax system? And uh, and if the government feels that they're not getting enough, don't they have to go into the tax system and raise the amount of taxes by a legislative act? Is not that obligation 
uh, and the right to receive already placed in the government in the form of taxing corporations, individuals, and just about everything that uh, that is living. Rick, do you? Uh, the straight answer is yes. That is, in fact, it's more than enough. It's an indulgence. Exactly. Uh, and I, let me just add one other thing. It, when when I was doing uh, running a large business actively, our our view of the government was it was an entity to be feared, frankly, because the issue on our minds was well are are the regulators going to find some sort of oversight in uh, our business that would require uh, you know a fine or something like that in other words uh, businessmen because of the stress and strain of actually running a business on a day-to-day -day basis and because they're so focused on making the sales ensuring the product is uh, of sufficient quality ensuring deliveries are made and so forth and hiring people and firing people and so forth the, the time they have to focus on regulatory risk is very very limited they usually outsource that to a lawyer but even the lawyers have trouble keeping up with the, you know the regular the density of regulatory uh, volume that comes out of the government and so from a, an entrepreneur's point of view, the government stands mainly as a source of risk that could ten, potentially shut down or damage his business in a very serious way. In a very serious way, and that—that's about the extent. And so, so, so to some, to, to some degree, all a, an entrepreneur wants to do is keep his distance from the government. Get the government off my back. Let me run my business. Let me serve my customers. And don't interfere. That is the mindset. Right. And pay his fair share, which is dictated by the tax code. And so when Obama or any of the legislative or the, any of the uh, of his uh, in his administration comes out to say that they have an obligation, successful people have an obligation to spread it around, really what he needs to do is go to Congress and get them to change the tax code that's already in place, that's already understood, that's already has a, that that allows people to operate and businesses to operate in an understanding way, so that they can conduct their own business and deliver their product as the rules are clear, and as soon as they are not clear or that they're changed rapidly, this causes a great deal of turmoil in the business community. And really, it may even be the, one of the reasons why we have such uncertainty is the, is the amount of change happening at the government level. And thus, the stock market isn't going anywhere. Investors aren't investing. Gross domestic product is so little now. Go ahead. I would add, and, and as an entrepreneur, I pay in at least three different ways, right? Because if I start the company and therefore own shares, right? Yes. And I ever want to sell those shares, I'm taxed on the capital gain, right? Yep. Uh, two, if I'm paid by the company, if I, if I draw a salary, an income from my company, I pay income tax on that, right? right. And three, if I die, uh, there are estate taxes, which are quite high in, 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 in many cases, both at the federal and the state level, that uh, I have to pay at the point of death. And therefore, anything, usually it's above a million dollars in the estate. It depends on the state you're in, but uh, there are usually estate taxes at both the federal and state level. So. Uh, you have to ask yourself as an entrepreneur, is starting a, a new business really that good a deal, at least in terms of how much of your wealth you have to spread around? I think that's quite a bit. Right. 
certainly more than your fair share, I would imagine. And, and, uh, and meanwhile, I, as an entrepreneur, I have been providing jobs to how many people I hire over the years and however, you know, for however large my business gets. So in terms of the benefit I provided society, you could argue it's enormous. And not only is it enormous, it's self-sustaining because I don't have to go tax my fellow citizens to run this thing. Right. Exactly. You're providing good by p sacrificing, by making a sacrifice and delivering a product from that sacrifice. And the good, the nature of that good is the deliverance of that product. And, and, we, and individuals deliver product because they know they want to better their lives. And so the way to do that is delivering that which has a goodness within the, within the product. And so the society that does well allows as many products to come to market as can be efficiently done. Which brings us to another question. Freedom. The freedom to deliver product to the marketplace. Has freedom been to do to, to bring product to the marketplace been impinged or in, uh, has been lessened? Has been uh, suffering uh, impingement from the current administration or even before the, this uh, administration? Is it not growing? Is government doesn't seem doesn't it seem to be growing and preventing? product to come to marketplace and preventing really goodness, the goodness of the, of the product to come to marketplace. What are your thoughts on this, Rick? Well, I, I think the most obvious example of administrative interference is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, here in the state of Washington, uh, which is a pretty green state, uh, you see evidence in many businesses, whether it's logging, mining, um, fisheries, and so forth, where uh, existing and newly rolled out EPA restrictions are making a, a business businesses that uh, were once practicable no longer practicable, uh, which would want to grow but can't grow at least in terms of the volume of business they want to do, uh, and where you know hiring that might have occurred on the back of that doesn't occur. And so uh, I think that's the most flagrant example I can think of at a local level. And at the federal level, I'm sure there are many others. Yes. Uh I remember early in the campaign uh, on the Republican side, uh, the fellow from Texas uh, wanted to uh, eliminate several of the departments within governments. And uh, I think he's right uh, that there's been a real impingement by government uh, preventing product uh, to come to the marketplace. And then, on top of the impingement by which are regulations, which happen before the market, before the product gets to marketplace, then you have the taxation after it does. So the government is getting us with regulations and laws before the product, preventing product to to flourish as it, as well as it could. And then once those that do flourish are being hit with taxation that is now the highest in the world. I believe corporate taxes uh, in the United States are now uh, just about the highest in the world. Is, uh, am I correct, Rick? Yeah, at, yes. Uh, at the highest uh, progressive rate it is, that's true. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of loopholes, so the effective tax rate may be lower for many businesses, but that the, the nominal level is certainly one of the highest.
I'll tell you a story about uh, this is again a local story about the the, the real idiocy, idiocy in some of these regulations. And, you know, in China they have a lot of soft coal, which is is dirty, and produces a lot of contaminants. And we have in the United States uh, hard coal, uh, higher quality coal, which it burns much more efficient efficiently. And in Washington, of course, we we have a you know some very important ports here that would serve as a an ideal means of, of boosting trade with China and more, more particularly exporting this high quality coal. Did you know that if you uh, mix uh, in the ratio of 75% to 25% soft coal with US hard coal, you reduce the contaminants by 50%. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Right? So the United States, whether it's through the state of Washington or through another location, has the opportunity, if they want to pursue it, to help China reduce its contaminants, which are notoriously growing at one of the fastest rates in the world. But it can't be done because we can't export the coal from, uh, at least in the case of Washington, our ports. Wow. Amazing story. And that's about all we have time for Amazing today. Amazing and typical. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about all we have time today on this segment of The Philosophical Angle. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.